Hey, Pre-Sales Collective, it's your host, James Kakis, and today's episode is something different. We're on video, so if you're listening from your favorite podcast player, you should be able to check out the video. If not, head over to presalescollective.com slash podcast for today's episode. The video is actually going to be of one of my favorite webinars over the past year. Kevin Mefford hosted Garen Hess, CEO and founder of Consensus, to talk about the six demo types. I don't know about you, but a couple of years ago, I always thought that there was one type of demo. And then I realized different audiences need different types of demos. And so in today's episode, Garen is going to talk about the six demo types, what they are, why they matter. And so if you're going into today's episode thinking, well, I demo my product the same way to everybody, I'm going to challenge you to think differently about that notion. So enjoy today's episode, enjoy the video. And if you have any feedback about this type of format, please let me know. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, if, if you haven't seen me yet, my name is Kevin Mefford. I'm the head of community for the Pre-Sales Collective. I uh, joined a few months ago to help James and UG uh, progress what we've been doing with the Pre-Sales Collective. So I'll, I'll be your host for today. Very glad that you have all joined us. Very excited about this topic and to have everyone on board. Before I start with the introductions, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you very much for everyone that's been involved with the Pre-Sales Collective. Uh, we can't do any of this without our members. So we're, we're so excited to have everyone along for the ride as we seek to elevate the role of pre-sales, building up this profession, making connections and relationships with other people uh, throughout the, the, uh, the world. So a few tips just on what we, we would like to see you get out of today's webinar. The, the biggest things, please ask questions. So uh, Garen is going to pre be presenting quite a bit of content. Feel free to ask questions. I do ask that you please put those into the, the Q&A. You should see that Q&A button down at the bottom of the Zoom. Just helps us keep track of where those questions are, uh, which ones have been answered and what's going through there. Uh, you're more than welcome to be active in the chat as well. Uh, so we encourage that participation. We want this to be an engaging topic and, and have you going back and forth. And to, to kick things off, we're going to start with a quick poll. So first off, just everyone out there, which option best describes your role? Are you an individual contributor as a, a sales engineer, or a solution consultant? Uh, are you on the sales side and, and joining in to, uh, to hear the secrets that we talk about? Um, or you may be someone that's actually sitting outside of free sales and you're just interested in trying to learn a little bit more about it. So we would love to have you answer into the poll, help us understand who's out there in the audience. Give that one more second. Got a lot of good participation coming in there. So thank you all very much. So as you can see, a lot of uh, pre-sales folks out there in that individual role, a lot of, of managers as well. So thank you again, all of you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you for spending your time with us. And with that, I, I would like to actually introduce our guest. So today, Garen Hess is going to be joining us and speaking about the, the six different types of, of demos. Now, Garen is a serial entrepreneur whose entire career has been based in enterprise software, including several roles acting as a sales engineer. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Consensus, the leader in intelligent demo automation software. And he's also an author. Garen recently published a book called Selling is Hard, Buying is Harder. You should definitely check it out. Uh, that emphasizes a buyer enablement approach to B2B sales. So not our classic uh, thinking everything from our side as the sellers. Now, outside of work, Garen enjoys reading history, mountain biking, hiking, writing, playing tennis, conducting choir, and spending time with his wife and their children. Uh, so thank you very much, Garen. So pleased to have you here and would, would love to have you add anything else. Well, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks, Kevin. And we love the pre-sales collective. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Well, I have a ton of stuff to go over with all of you today, so probably just going to dive in here. But um, yeah, this has been a passion of mine to try to help scale this particular aspect of the pre-sales function for a lot of years um, and, and help make this more effective, not only for pre-sales folks um, that we are, but also for the buyers specifically, because the whole goal is to help them 
achieve what they need to accomplish what they need to accomplish. And that's really where my angle comes from on all of this is looking at all this from the buyer's perspective. And I hope that what I share today can be helpful to you. What I'm going to share today has uh, applicability, whether you're using demo automation technology or not. Obviously, um, I'm the CEO and founder of Consensus, and we provide demo automation solutions, intelligent demo automation to enterprise software companies to help scale pre-sales. But the, the content I'm sharing today is all about how to fit the right demo to the right uh, stage of the buying cycle. So what are we going to learn today? How building and delivering the right demos at the right stages using the right methods and roles can help scale pre-sales while also improving the customer experience. So <clears throat> just briefly about consensus, with consensus, you we help scale pre-sales with intelligent demo automation. So just this is all I'm really going to say about uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to cover a little bit about how demo automation fits into this, but as an overall uh, overview of the company, just so you know what we do. Um, Pre-sales teams build reusable libraries of interactive video demos that then sales sends out on demand, and then we track how the buyers are engaging with it, and this helps drive uh, better buying experiences, and it also helps to shorten the sales cycle and free up pre-sales resources, and, we're, and, and that will be one of our main focuses today. Um, do want to encourage you to take a look at the book if you're interested, and um, I, I think this is a, um, of interest to anybody on this call, even though it, it's much broader. We do cover some of this content in the book, but the book is research-based content about how to enable not only your champion, but your champion to go sell to the other stakeholders in the buying group. So that's a broader topic. We have other topics on buyer enablement in our own scaling pre-sales webinar series that we, pre we present on. So first of all, I just want to set the ground uh, or the, the baseline definition of scaling pre-sales. A lot of times when I say scaling pre-sales, people think we're talking about hiring people. Oh, we're going to scale our pre-sales organization. So we're going to hire tons of people. That's not what we're talking about. Hi scaling Hiring is not scaling. Scaling is when you get exponential results out of existing resources. Now, I'm not saying you can't add people, but if you're not working on how to get more results out of the same headcount, then you're not really exercising or working on true scale. And so that is what our whole organization is, 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 is organized around, is to help pre-sales teams scale effectively. Now, there's lots of different ways to do that. And today, we're just going to be talking about demos and specifically how to be more effective at demos and how we can apply different approaches to um, building and delivering those demos in a way that can help support scaling. So what are some of the big obstacles to scaling pre-sales? And uh, uh, we can get into this and in, in other, in other topics, but just to give a, a brief rundown of some of the challenges that we see, obviously overload in the work required for pre-sales. We're now seeing that pre-sales is being pulled across the entire funnel uh, and not just traditionally in the, in the late stages of the buying cycle. And so that creates a lot of challenge. The sales and marketing mismatch, uh, meaning sales and marketing will say something and pre-sales has to kind of come in and fill, uh, fill in with the reality or, the, or be the source of truth. Um, you also might have just scale issues with sales and marketing growing, but not having a matching ability to hire to, to meet additional sales and marketing um, advertising or promotions. Multilingual market coverage is always challenging. Some of our customers cover a dozen or more language markets. Going down market where the deal sizes are smaller, the volume's higher, you can't really apply the same high-touch sales process that you're used to. And then of course, what Peter Cohen calls wasted demos or in our sales engineering workload report, we, we call unqualified or underqualified demos can be a big problem or obstacle to scale. So resulting problems that come from all this is clients are waiting for the demo or for the pre-sales resources. Um, the, the research shows that uh, they wait on a median of at least a week and quite often two weeks or more. It's a bad experience. Sales is waiting. That's not great for, for sales. They're frustrated. Um, 
we end up wasting resources because we ha we're doing a lot of unqualified demos. Our, our SEs, our solution consultants are overworked, causes morale issues. Um, you probably can identify with having morale issues on some of your teams where you're getting just stretched too thin. You're doing lots of repetitive uh, demos. And this robotic repetition is the last thing here is just the problem is as an industry, we spend too much time on on this repetitive demo. Uh, the, the repetitive demos are not an, uh, enough of our total available time on strategic consulting. So again, the focus here is the six different demo types and then where do they belong in the buying process or the buying journey? Um, and how are they different? Because a buyer doesn't want to have the same demo at the same stage. In fact, one of the challenges we have in our industry is we say the demo and what we, and sales and as sales engineers, we often think of the technical demo when we say the demo. And yet buyers really need and expect many different types of demos along the process. And indeed, most of you are probably, or people on your team are probably delivering these demos already, but you may not call them demos. <laughs> so it's important to identify them and be able to effectively understand where the buyer is and then how to match that up with what they need. So in this research by Gartner a few years ago, they asked buyers what they want most from vendors. And not surprisingly, the number one thing was demonstrations followed by case studies and then value assessment tools. And the problem is that there's kind of this interesting dichotomy in that buyers want demonstrations, but a lot of organizations are hesitant to give them right away. So um, we're going to address that um, as, as one of the fundamental things that we need to, to break up is this reticence to deliver the demos right away. To, before I get into the details, I just want to briefly introduce you to the six demo types. And, and we're going to talk about the details, but just so you understand the what these are, are, are labeled, the vision demo, and I borrow this from Peter Cohen, so give some credit to him. The vision demo, the micro demo, the qualifying demo, um, often called just the standard demo, the pre-sales or, or technical demo, and what we call closing demos. Now, these all match up with different stages of the buying process. And we'll, we'll dive into these in more detail, but I just want to give you this, this high, high level flyby. And then the sixth type, because you only notice there are only five types here, is what I call FAQ demos, which actually happen throughout the entire buying process. So we're going to jump into this status quo and going back to this issue of buyers want demos, but one of the status quo issues is that Many organizations say, well, we, we shouldn't demo too early because if you demo too early, you give away too much and plus they're not ready for it and it just confuses them and it, it's just not helpful. Uh, in fact, one of my customers sent me um, a, a, a video they had <laughs> recently of a call where the, the sales engineer was trying desperately to avoid giving a demo and the, and the CEO of the vendor or the buyer and his team Keep, kept asking for this demo. Well, we'd like to see a demo. And the sales engineer is like, well, first we got to do discovery and then we'll do a demo. And the CEO is going, oh, no, I really want to see a demo. And then I'll tell you if I want to do discovery. But the sales engineer is really going back and forth saying, well, yes, we can do that, but we're not prepared to do that today. And finally, uh, they relented and delivered a type of a demo. And I won't get into the details of how. And um, they and the, and, and the CEO goes, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, you know, can we talk about pricing? And it was just this. <laughs> and so he was really jumping around. But but really, you see this mismatch. Um, so it was interesting in this video to actually see this in a real scenario playing out uh, and then them delivering the demo that the buyer wanted. But but there's this problem. Let's don't demo. Let's hold back. Let's hold back the demo. It's super valuable. Plus, we don't want to confuse them. So the other status quo issue is, and it's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, is the customer's always right. Let's demo whenever they want. So if the demo asks for it, we're going to give it to them. And both of these cause problems. So the problems with, with this option, one, number one over here, is that more than 70% of prospects have to wait one to three weeks. That's a terrible customer experience. And if you don't deliver them a demo and they want one, they're going to go look for a competitor that will. 
So it's frustrating to them. It's frustrating to sales. It opens doors to competitors. The, the problem on the other side is that you could overwhelm them with information. We're just using sales engineering resources willy nilly, and uh, and it it's a, a waste of resources because a lot of those are going to be unqualified, and we'll dive into some of that too. So this is the status quo, um, and this is one one of the the funda, These are the funda, two of the fundamental challenges that you're dealing with when you're talking about how to scale and, and, and talking about demos and this mismatch between what buyers want and what, what as pre-sales organizations, we are, are, are trying to deliver. So in, in summary, if, when we say never demo too early, or um, you might say the big problem is funnel attrition, because if they have to wait one to three weeks or more, what are they going to do during that time? And every, 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 all of us in sales, technical sales know that time, added time in the sales cycle is risk. And on the, on the flip side, when we say the customer is always right, we're just wasting pre-sales resources. So as I mentioned, demo is, I would say, too narrowly defined. And so we've come up with a lexicon of different types of demos that and, and we need to get out of this idea of I'm just delivering a demo. It's like, what type of demo am I delivering? Because if we don't have it defined in our minds, one, we're going we're gonna to misuse our resources. Two, we're pro- we may very well not deliver the right type of demo to the buyer that they need at that time. So as a thought exercise, I just want to focus on buyer empathy. This is a uh, something I talk about extensively in the book, and that is that our perspective is usually around what we're doing in sales and pre-sales. And we need to be more thoughtful about what is the buyer actually trying to get done? And I would argue that if you focus on this, you will make huge gains in your close rates and your sales cycle if if you just change your focus to the buyer empathy. And most sales engineers and pre-sales professionals are better at this than the sales counterparts, but we all can improve in this area. So a few things here is just putting yourself in in the buyer's shoes and asking, what do they really want to know at each stage? What are they trying to accomplish? And what are they ready for, right? And I think a lot of solution consultants naturally think of these some of these things, but I want to get more granular. And hopefully this will be helpful as as we talk through this and get us more into the buyer's mind. So I want to give some credit to Kevin Davis, who wrote the Sales Manager's Guide to Greatness. The sales or the buying process that I'm using, this need, learn, buy, the change, discontent, research, comparison, fear, commit, up through the first close is his or his stages. Um, and he's given me permission to share these, uh, but I highly recommend this book. Excellent book. Um, and, and I like how he has the, you know, this is a, a sales cycle. It doesn't show it as a funnel because you're, you're getting... A close, and then you've got to go into building value. Then you've got to go back into another uh, buying cycle, right? As you get the renewals and expansions. So we have these down this side, right? So that's how those match up. And roughly, you see the first stage is just this need uh, where they have discontent or they see an opportunity. Then they want to go out and do some research. And as they do research, they're going to learn about different vendors and things, and they're going to start doing some comparisons. Uh, then they're narrowing it down and making a purchase decision, but then they're scared to death because what if they're making the wrong decision and they've got to make a final commitment? So we're going to analyze each one of these stages and what the buyers are thinking about and what they're needing at each one of these stages. So again, this thought exercise um, and the vision demo is the first type. It's at the top of their, their journey as the buyer is just starting to think about, man, I don't like how things are in my world, or I like it, but there's a better op, you know, could be even better. They, they, they identify this need. So what are some of the things they're thinking about at this stage? Um, they're, they're just looking, as they're doing initial research, they're just asking questions like, will this solution help me achieve my objectives or solve this big problem, or even this, this company? Will the company help it? Do I think this is a good company to look into further? Now, what will my life be like or my company's life? And, and we have to remember both. It's not just about the, the 
the state of the company after they purchase your solution, but it's it's the actual individual and their emotional state, the, what their life is like um, after after they adopt the solution. And then how have other companies succeeded? They're they're already starting to look at what are other people doing about this problem and how are they finding success? And that's why at the beginning, this is the vision demo. And this and the vision demo should really be something focused on a problem, solution, benefit. Now you can ignore these little guidelines on minutes for the moment. I'll come back to those. So just focus as we look at these on what's the basic definition of this. The, the vision demo is hardly going to touch on product. It's going to be focused on the problems, solution, and benefit. And you might, if you touch on product, it's very light. Just show a little of this, a little of that, maybe a screenshot here and there. Um, we'll come back to who should be billing these, but I'll just say here that this is often built by marketing, and this is the only demo that marketing should build. Um, and we'll come back to some of these other aspects of this vision type of demo. But this, this type of demo matches what they're needing right here. They don't want anything more than that. If you give them more than that, yeah, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. So um, they'll they'll get stuck or they'll they'll choke on if you give them more than this. So a lot of this is is designed around making sure we right size the demo to the stage that the buyer's in. So the next stage is in their learning and researching. Here we're talking about the micro demo. This one is definitely more product oriented. However, it is generic. Now let's talk about why. What they're looking for here is, hey, I like this vision. I, I like how my future life will be if this vision actually comes about, if I can trust this company. But now I want to see the product. In general, how does the solution work? This People want to get in and, and see and have a demonstration of the product right away. And again, this is kind of a mismatch with a lot of us in pre-sales that are often hesitant to, to do that. Um, uh, too early. And so, but but you are getting pulled in more and more obviously, as you know, to do these quick demos that your sales will just say, hey, we, somebody wants a demo in 20 minutes or 10 minutes. You're just thinking, well, what in the heck am I going to show them in that amount of time? And, and it's frustrating because you know this is probably not going to be that effective. But what we're talking about here is what the buyer needs, not what you want to do or if you know how, how to deliver this. What the buyer needs is what we call a micro demo. They want at this stage to say, I like the vision. Now just show me enough of the product so I can go, huh, okay, well, I think that makes sense. Matches with the vision. I want to, I want to move forward with more exploration. So at this stage, they don't want to be overwhelmed. Just They want to be shown just what they're interested in. And this is sometimes where as solution consultants, we, we're so excited about all the stuff that we can deliver, we overdo it and we dump on them too much. So there needs to be a little discovery, obviously, if you're going to match up only what they are interested in. But you don't want to overwhelm either. And what the buyer is doing at this stage is they're looking for obvious disqualifiers. So this could be... Um, I don't like the people I'm talking to. I don't like some aspect of the product. It doesn't look easy enough to use. And this is one of the, the, the real, real challenges that we, you have if you have a really bad user interface. You have to try to figure out, hmm, how do I give them a demo without scaring them away before they understand all the value that it can provide? And that's why the vision demo is so important up front. And then lastly, help me connect the dots between the vision and how the solution gets us there. So, so that's the, where the micro demo fits in. There's just preliminary uh, early research. They're digging in and starting to do some early, early checking to see if they want to go further. The next one is the qualifying demo. And by qualifying, what I mean by this is that the buyer is really qualifying you in or out of their short list. And they're comparing you in a lot of detail at this stage with other, other vendors. However, they still don't need at this stage a custom demo usually. It can still be a generic demo, but they're just trying to decide, is this have the right type of features and the right things um, and the benefits? Am I going to get the right all this together compared to these others that I'm looking at? And they want to they get deep enough that they feel they can make, they can make decisions about their short list. Again, we'll come back to who's building these and so on. but. 
uh, this is uh, what we call the qualifying or discovery demo, because a lot of times you're discovering a lot as you're doing this demo. What are they asking for here? The buyers are thinking about things like this. I'm generally convinced this is a good potential solution. Now I'm getting serious, right? So I've, I've narrowed this down to at least my serious companies I'm looking at. It may not be my final shortlist, but it's I'm serious about digging in. I want to dig deeper. I'm narrowing down this list of solution. Still, only show what interests me. I don't need a full-blown custom proof of concept. I don't need all of that yet. And one of the main things they, they're really digging into at this stage is how is your solution different from other vendors? So when you're demoing the qualifying demo, you want to emphasize that. What are your main differentiators? And you might even, depending on what your approach is in your, your process, you might even mention how you compare to other competitors. Or you may not, depending on, on whether you don't normally uh, bring up competitors. It all depends on, on your your MO and your, your approach. However, you do want to you do want to emphasize what is the differentiation and the main the main things that you, they want to hang their hat. You, you want them to hang their hat on as they think about you. Then of course the the live or, or technical demo. Now all these could be live and they and they often are and that's part of the challenge. Um, but this the pre-sales technical demo is the one that we normally think of as the demo. It's the big hour long or more, sometimes multiple days in some cases where you're demoing very complex solutions. And this is now that you're down to a final short list. You might even be down to, they've selected you in their mind. They've maybe even given you a verbal. They are just wanting you to demonstrate that, that you can deliver the solution that they need. This is obviously uh, a custom demo and the things that they're thinking about at this stage are, I need to verify the solution's really going to work in our environment. Um, is it going to, is it going to be effective? Um, are you going to deliver? You've made my short list, but I'm afraid of making a bad decision. This is what they're, they're thinking about at this stage. They want to de-risk. So this type of demo, uh, we'll come back to this, but we do not recommend nor think that uh, it's a good demo to, to try to automate. It's neither practical nor uh, effective, with one exception, which I'll point out, um, whereas the others are all po potential candidates for automation, which we'll, we'll talk about. Closing demos. Now, a lot of times we think that we have concluded when we finished our demo, our technical demo, and maybe we've done this two or three times because there are different stakeholders coming in, but then there's this period where they've made a commitment. They say, hey, absolutely, we're ready. We're into red lines. We're getting, marking up the contracts. But the buyers are still analyzing. And they're asking things like, hey, I'm convinced you're the right vendor, but I still have all these questions about how we get the results. Like, um, what, do, what does implement, implementation look like? How long does it take? How much time do I have to be involved? What kinds of roles need to be involved? And let's map out the specific way this is going to roll out. Is there training involved? And how do I get access to it? How do you integrate with our other systems? Sometimes this is a bit of an afterthought if it's not a number one priority, but all of a sudden some stakeholder comes in and says, oh, have you thought about how it integrates with such and such? Oh, well, no, but we still need the solution. Um, and so these are what we call closing questions or, or problems that the buyer is trying to solve. and at this stage, they're asking a lot about data security. All of these things can be wrapped up into a category of, of you might say, fear. They're making a commitment, but they're afraid of making a mistake. And so uh, these closing demos are, are usually very product-oriented, but not always, such as data security, GDPR, and things like that. And I would lump those into types of demos, even though you might not be demoing product, they're, they're actually maybe some product aspects to things like that as well. So if we go back and again, match these up, we've talked about all the different things the buyers are thinking about and what they're trying to solve at these different stages. I wanna encourage you as, as you work with buyers to think very specifically about that as you build out the demos for those different stages. Now, sometimes you're gonna be Combining these, the vision and micro demo might 
go together sometimes. It, um, so it's not always going to be six demo types, um, but you have to make that adjustment with the focus on what is the buyer thinking about? What are the problems they're trying to solve? What are the tasks or jobs they're trying to get done at that stage in the buying process? Now, I want to just take a little aside here and talk about buyer enablement. And one big principle in buyer enablement is you know better than they do how to buy your own solution. So you should be in charge of the buying process for them because you've guided all these buyers through the buying process many times. They're, they're going through this process probably the, the first and maybe only time in their life buying your, your solution or your category of solution. So one of the things that you want to have mapped out in your mind and, and even on paper, if you can, is what is the, the, the most effective buying process? What are the pitfalls? And one of the approaches you want to take that I recommend is predicting, anticipating ahead of time what the buyer needs to do next. And so by thinking about it in this structured way you, and thinking about these stages that the buyer is going through, then you're going, to, um, you're going to be able to make recommendations uh, more effectively. And this builds a lot of trust. If you really recognize and understand what the buyer needs and you're anticipating this and saying, hey, at this stage, normally we see buyers like you and companies like yours and segment, industry, whatever. This is what they're looking for. I'd like to recommend this. How does that sound? Oh, yeah. And wow. All of a sudden, the buyer thinks, yeah, you understand what I'm talking about, what I need. So, so that's just a principle from buyer enablement is you know the process better than they do. Anticipate their needs ahead of time. And when you're staying one step ahead of them, it builds a lot of trust. And part of uh, and, and this this fits into that that kind of an approach because you can once they've seen the vision, you can the vision demo. You can say, hey, you know, now that you've seen that, um, I'd really recommend that you take a little bit deeper dive. And here's a micro demo. Oh, wow, that's great. You know, if you can anticipate that before the buyer even asks for it, that builds a ton of trust. Not not to mention it shortens the sales cycle. So let's take a look at these demos in, in a slightly different way, which is to say who builds them, kind of what's the objective of each one. So briefly, the length, these are just rough guidelines as, as we recommend if you're going to automate them. And again, we'll come back to automated demos. So, But think of these as relative you know, sizes. So you may... You may have a vision demo that's a half an hour, and your technical demo is five hours, right? Um, so, but these are these when you're when you end up automating with interactive video demos, you you're definitely going to be trying to keep within certain guidelines. So, vision demo again, problem, solution, benefit, the product, light on pr product. If anything, it's, it's looking at a screenshot. The goal is to really gain them as a truly qualified lead. And who's building these? Marketing. So these are usually marketing-oriented materials or, or decks or things like that. As you, as you can see, this is the only type of demo that we recommend that marketing should build. All the others really need to be built by pre-sales. So um, on that point, Gartner recently released uh, a research note where they had this interesting quote where it said that buyers want content that they find most valuable is content that is rich in technical detail and cannot be easily faked. <laughs> well, that is pre-sales to a T. Um, well, there's no T in pre-sales, so it's pre-sales with a P. In any case, um, that they want, they want content that's true product content. So again, vision, marketing. That's, so if marketing wants to get involved in all your demos, uh, try to keep them out of this. Even if you, even if you, start implementing digital pre-sales and, and interactive video demos and those kinds of things. Marketing may want to get in because sometimes marketers think I should own all things digital. You want to keep them out. Um, buyers will not like it. They won't find it valuable. Um, so you just say, yeah, great marketing. Here's your vision demo. Build us a vision demo. We can use that. Sales can use that. Um, but stay out of all of these other areas. 
So the micro demo is light product centered, high level overview. What you're really doing here, the objective is to prepare the prospect for the first appointment and discover stakeholders. Now, this is if it's automated. If you're delivering it live, it is probably going to be in your first appointment. Um, again, you, you're probably thinking, well, you wouldn't want a demo in your first appointment. Well, that's true if you're doing it the old way. The new way, remember, buy, what do buyers want most? In that first appointment, they want to see some kind of micro demo. Um, so we're going to come back to should these be automated or delegated? Um, but generally speaking, uh, yeah, micro demos are great for automation and potentially delegating. Um, qualifying a discovery demo, again, this is where they're trying to qualify you. You're discovering more about them. You're also trying to further qualify them. And this is a deeper vanilla demo with a reminder on the problem solution benefit. You want to keep emphasizing the benefits and the problems you're solving. This is very product centered, but it's still generic. And one of the main goals here is to discover stakeholders and to qualify for a pre-sales resource. We're going to come back to this concept, but the question here is, at this point, uh, should they be qualified for sales engineering resources? You're thinking, well, aren't these all sales engineering? This is where we're going to talk about automation and how this could apply. Technical demo, obviously, uh, is tailored. This is what all, the, all of you sales engineers are so good at and uh, kind of the standard technical deep dive demo. The goal here is to win the shortlist and or a, and or a verbal decision or even be the last step in the final final before the signature. And then closing demos are just in that final stage where they have questions about how this is all actually going to work. And the goal is to increase confidence, and what I call emotional ROI. I don't have time to talk about emotional ROI, but you can go out to our website at goconsensus.com and go look in our blog for emotional ROI. There's some articles on that. But it's basically, there is a calculation going on in the buyer's head about how much energy and effort and risk they have to put into it personally and how much they're going to get out of it in return. And so that's that's the summary of, of emotional ROI. And, and when you're closing, there all of a sudden that calculation all of a comes to, all of a sudden comes to the forefront big time because it's getting super real. And lastly, the FAQ demo, these are usually pretty short. They're specific responses to questions. And again, these can happen throughout, and they're meant to overcome objections or preempt objections, which again. I would recommend uh, thinking about preempting them by by offering these kinds of things ahead of time. So where do these belong? Um, we're just going to kind of zip through these, but the idea is that vision demos really early on might even be presented, might be on, part on the website, it might be presented by a, a BDR, SDR. Micro demos often uh, in this first or second appointment, and the qualifying or discovery demo is often in, in those first early appointments. And this is just an example sales cycle. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is notice that the micro, uh, at, this, at this level, we're talking about an MQL. At this stage, we're talking about the sales qualified lead. Well, the qualifying and discovery demo, we've come up with a new term called the demo qualified lead because what organizations often are missing is a gate through which buyers need to pass to qualify for pre-sales resources. And we think this is what we call the, the qualifying or discovery demo. So I would encourage you to, to encourage your own organization to implement DQL as, a, as an official stage. And this will help put process, regardless of how you define it, so put process around what are the criteria to get a pre-sales uh, person engaged. And many of our customers will use an interactive video demo as the gate. If they will go through um, the qualifying or discovery demo, sometimes the micro demo they use as the DQL, um, but uh, I think that's that's something that you should consider doing if you're not doing already. And of course, the technical demo, um, this is many weeks. This is a very short sales cycle. You might say three months, but um, just in relative terms, this is later stage usually, as you already know. And then closing usually are in those last final weeks before the signature. So one concept I want to throw out here is what we call selling between meetings. So Gartner Research shows that buyers are spending only 17% of their time with, uh, with vendors. And if you are competing with maybe three, 
three other, two other competitors, maybe you only get 5% of their time. So the question is, how do you, how do you educate them or how do you sell to them in between meetings? And how do you equip them with what they need in between these meetings? So we call this selling between meetings or sometimes selling in the gaps. And this, again, the vision demo, uh, let's say somebody signs up on the website. Here's an example of vision or, or let's say the micro demo. Say they sign up on the website, they watch a little video, explainer video or something that gives them a, a little vision of what they need. A BDR calls them, sets up an appointment. Well, in between this, the, the time the appointment is set and the time the appointment happens, you can engage them with a micro demo. And this is, of course, if you're, if you're automating it in some way. And this will help shorten the sales cycle because they are educating, not only keep the momentum going. So again, these different types of demos can be used in the gaps or in between meetings to continue to sell. And not only, and by sell, I mean educate. And not only are you educating them, but you're equipping them with something that they can effectively use to educate other stakeholders. So I know there's a lot to absorb here, but uh, I, just the main emphasis here is just selling in the gaps or selling in between meetings. How do you equip your champion with that? So now that we've talked about what, are the, what does the buyer need at each stage? What types of demos match up with those needs at each stage? The question is, well, should I automate any of these? Well, the first reaction by most sales, pre-sales leaders or professionals, when you talk about automating pre-sales, or going to digital pre-sales is absolutely no way. It makes no sense. And I totally get that having done a lot of pre-sales work myself. And I think a lot of that stems from, that initial reaction stems from, well, we, we think of the demo as the technical demo and, and we should not automate that. that. That is uniquely where sales engineers, solution consultants need to focus. The problem is they're spending less and, their, less, and less of their time doing that. They're spending more and more of their time doing repetitive demos and lots of other low value tasks. And the goal here is, can we automate some portion of this in a way that will free up or reallocate time for pre-sales to focus on other things? So I think to understand whether what we should automate is, we should under, ask ourselves, what is demo automation? And this comes down to how do you personalize at scale? Because if you're going to automate something, one of the first resistance feelings that comes up is, well, I don't want it to be a bad experience. So you need to figure out how do you personalize at scale? And the other thing about bad experiences, buyers, they actually don't want to wait to talk to somebody to get a demo, at least in those early stages. They, th there's a lot of evidence in the research that shows they don't want to talk to sales unless they have to. They like talking to sales engineering, but they would rather consume things on their own if they can. And so the, the challenge is how do you personalize at scale um, effectively if you're going to automate? So just briefly about how consensus does this, it asks in your demo, you have these different topics or um, features or benefits, problem statements, whatever, and they're going to indicate what is very important, somewhat important or not important to them. And then consensus gathers video clips and documents based on their responses and serves up a, a tailored demo to each stakeholder in the, in the buying group. And it serves it up in an environment that where it's got these video clips and, and documents. And then of course, you get notifications when they watch and so on. And, and the, the buyers are engaging and potentially sharing with other stakeholders and as, as they share, you start getting what we call the buyer matrix view or a view of all the different stakeholders, what is most interesting to them. So these green dots represent very important and these light green, somewhat important. These are not important. So again, if you're asking automation, when you, when you consider demo automation platforms, what you want to ask yourself is how, how does this personalize at scale and how can I see how all the different stakeholders what's driving their interests effectively in, in relative comparison to each other. And if you can get that kind of data, then some of these demos can be automated um, and, and you can reallocate more of that time. So in brief, just the way that this demo automation works, the sales rep looks takes a demo from this reusable library of demos 
and will send out the demo. The prospect receives the email. They go in and launch, answer these questions, select their interest levels. They view the custom demo. They share it with others. Other people engage, and you get this flywheel effect of viral sharing and stakeholder discovery. So um, if that is of interest to you, the stake, organic stakeholder discovery, that's a, that's a key aspect to buyer enablement and shortening the sales cycle because, <coughs> excuse me, because you think about what causes that sales cycle to be so long, a lot of it is you got to do demo after demo, engagement after engagement with stakeholder after stakeholder. What if you could discover and engage a, a, a large group of them before you're even your first call? Um, you can see how that can have an impact. So where, where should we automate and which one should we not automate? So the good news is that you can automate most of these. Really, the only one that you should definitely not try to automate is the technical demo, which is the one that most of you are so uniquely qualified to do. Sales engineers, highly technical, are ready to, or consultative, they're ready to come up with uh, the unique solutions and all of that. That's not the repetitive part. But what you want to do is, is free up more of a solution consultant's time to spend more time doing that and less time on these repetitive, these repetitive aspects, but still get the buyers what they need, right? And that's why automation can, can really help. So if you're asking, which ones can I automate? And, and there are lots of different ways to try to automate. I'll just say that. Um, obviously, I'm biased to how we do it. Um, you could even try, uh, if you don't have budget for technology, you can go out and try YouTube or Zoom videos and things like that. Um, it's just, again, you have to ask yourself about the personalization aspect and how you, how you engage and understand who's engaging. But I don't want to discourage you thinking, if I don't, you know, if I don't have budget, I can't even do any of this. I would, I would attempt to use some even free tools if you can get them if, uh, if you don't have budget right at the moment, um, just to start offloading some of this from your pre-sales team. Um, so, so the demo, which demos to automate, we covered. And I'm running low on time here, so I'm going to try to wrap this up quickly. Um, so just a re-emphasis on the DQL, the Demo Qualified Lead. Um, I would just suggest asking you this, or you ask this question, is it worth making your buyers wait? And if you think, no, it's not worth it, we should then, then ask them who can get them what they want. And... And so then if you're, if you, if you're thinking who can get them what do we want, often the, the, the answer to that is, well, pre-sales, only pre-sales, because only we do demos. Well, I would suggest that that's, that's the challenge we need to free that up either through automation or delegation. So there's this really interesting book by a guy named Rory Vaden called Procrastinate on Purpose, which I love that title, um, goes to the human nature in all of us. And he talks about eliminating, automating, and delegating as a way to multiply time, which you could apply a lot of these principles to this problem of scaling your pre-sales team. So focusing on uh, automating and delegating are key to scaling your pre-sales team. And so what can you automate and what can you delegate? And if we look at the same chart that we had before, and you look at automation, yes, on the vision demo, website, BDR outreach, the micro demo can also be automated, even delegated sometimes to BDRs or AEs. It's more challenging to delegate, but if you can give them an automated demo, they can use. And then the qualifying demo, usually you're not going to delegate this, but it is can be automated. Sometimes you're not going to automate this one. And then the technical demo um, the one exception to, auto, to not automating, because we wouldn't normally recommend that, is we've seen success with some customers that if they're in a large enterprise uh, conversation and they'll, they'll build an automated demo to send as a follow-on after the, uh, the technical demo for those that didn't make it or if they just want to continue engaging. 
And we've actually seen that champions and stakeholder groups, if you send that follow on, will engage multiple times afterwards. And that not only saves you time, but keeps that momentum going. It gets them what they need right when they need it. So, so the closing demos is great for automation. Um, they're usually similar to FAQ demos in that they're short um, about a specific question, but really they're at the end of the at this buying cycle. So just would want to ask you to think about this. If the buyers and the buying groups in your deals could get what they need when they want it, how would it impact their likelihood to purchase? So I think I think there's a, a lot to uh, unpack there, but just to leave that in your mind. And then another one, another thought from the pre-sales team side is if 90% of your SE's time were spent on technical demo setup, prep, rehearsal, delivery, and strategic conversations, maybe POCs, whatever the high value activities are that you think, how would it change your business? So those are the last thoughts. And then I thought I would uh, share one bonus demo type. So you came for six, I'm going to give you seven. The last one is what I would call the instant demo. So there is an ability, for example, in consensus to click record and just quickly create a screen recording, send it out. Um, it doesn't take time, you know, pre-build it. It's just maybe in response to a, a, a question or something. And the instant demo can be really effective um, at being a highly personalized experience just in response to specific questions that are unique to that customer. So that's my seventh demo type, just to give you more than you expected. So I know that's a ton to cover. I probably need to learn how to shorten this a little bit. <laughs> so in any case, I'm happy to answer some questions with the time that remains. Yeah, so I, I did have one. I wanted to throw it out to you, Garen, that came up. Uh, yeah. So across those six types, taking automation out of it, because obviously you touched on that, but yeah. it, is that going to lead to buyer frustration if as sales and pre-sales people were saying, well, wait, there are three more demos you need to set, sit through or... You know, how do you see that flowing through the different cycles? That's a great question. And no, you, you never want to force the buyer to have to go through these. Um, however, if, if you offer them as the next step or one of the next steps, then you'll quickly understand if that's what the buyer is ready for. So again, in, in a buyer enablement approach, what you're doing is making recommendations and asking them to commit. You're never forcing it on them. However, what we found is that most of the time, when you make these recommendations, the buyers love it. Um, and again, they won't, they generally won't feel that frustration because they're gradually learning just more and more. It feels to them like a natural extension of what they've already been through. And if you do it at the right times, you make those recommendations, it actually feels like you're being this really helpful, value adding. Um, helpful person and consultant that's that's guiding them. So, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't just say you've got to go through and have to, you know, have to sit through this qualifying demo if you're ready to close or something. So, but, it, but, but generally speaking, buyers as a group want these types of demos. So when you make these recommendations, they'll actually be grateful that you're, you're trying to guide them through them. And, and so another one you, you talked early on about using that, that discovery demo, the qualification, have you seen people develop uh, solid boilerplates for that quick, you know, elicitation and demo all within a short period of time. Have you have you seen any good tips you would share there? Yes, great question. And there's a we could do a separate webinar on just how to build these kinds of demos effectively. Um, so, um, one main thing I'm going to emphasize is what we call think YouTube, not Hollywood, when you're building out um, product videos, for example, or screen recordings. So there's a, a research, I mean, a, a experiment we did, I should say, on highly produced video versus what I would, we call authentic or genuine video content. And counterintuitive to us when we did this research back in 2018 is that highly produced content with motion graphics, voice over uh, artist, and all of this gets much less engagement. To the time to the tune of 3x less engagement than demos that demo videos that are uh, screen recordings as if the sales engineer is just sitting next to them. 
So that would be number one is think YouTube, not Hollywood. Think about YouTube behavior. You're going to go out. Who wants to watch a corporate video on YouTube? None of us hardly ever do that, but we'll watch some person talk in another language, explaining how to some product. We don't even understand their language because they're an expert. Um, so that's much more valuable. And that's another reason to try to keep marketing from, from getting involved. So, so some, some quick things about that. Use a screen recorder um, to build out the, the specific content. It, you can on those early stages, like the, the uh, vision demo can just have screenshots in a, in a deck. Even the micro demo could be deck-based with sort of a click-through kind of thing. Some people build these out PowerPoint even, um, or they'll run. And again, if you're going to send these out on their own, you could do that. Or you could, uh, if you're going to delegate that to, say, an SDR or AE, um, then you want to build out these uh, just very basic kind of click through. And some of you, I'm sure, are already doing some of that. But but focus on authentic, genuine content, not highly produced at that at, all, at any of those stages except the vision demo. All right, pre sales collective. I hope you enjoyed this format as much as I did. Thank you, Garen and Kevin, for such an incredible webinar. For more great pre sales content and to hear from some of the best pre sales professionals from all over the world, please visit our member hub. We hope to see you on our fall back to school tour. We hope to see you at Leadership Next, the Executive Summit, or in one of our enablement programs. As always, we'll see you next week.